you're not hiring? Can I get some show of hands of people who aren't hiring? Do you need a job? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, Agile and Lean. I put a fancy academic title up here, but really what I'm going to talk about is I don't know how this thing works. <laughs> technology is hard. I didn't study technology in college. I was studying poetry. Uh -oh. Okay, I'll bet. I'll use these buttons. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so uh, the the real title of my talk is is also this is also not working. Hey, this is fun. There we go. Waste reduction. You're doing it wrong. So I'm going to tell you a secret about software development. Um, waste is an emergent property of software development. In fact, waste is an emergent property of all human activity. Uh, waste is unavoidable. The issue isn't waste, but it's how we manage the waste that really makes a difference. So I'm going to put up this chart that I started to start get a little bit famous for. Um, this is what happens. As you're going along, uh, at some point you're going to make a bad design decision. Has anyone here made a bad design decision? Hey? Did you know right away? So what happens is you don't know right away, and then you go on for a while, predicating all your new design decisions on your old design decision, and even your basis for comparison is wrong, so you're making more wrong design decisions, and that results in a whole bunch of wasted effort. And there's a whole methodology built on this called waterfall. That's built on maximizing the amount of waste in the system. <laughs> um, the real big problem with this is the time it takes before you find out that you did it wrong. Usually it's a month or a year. Uh, usually, co co-terminal with your actual launch of the product, and when that happens, your product launch tool looks a lot like this. Has anyone had this happen? Uh, we're in the Twitter group. Has anyone this has ever happened? Okay, so this is a problem, right? Like if you launch something and it fails catastrophically, that's a problem. Um, but this isn't here. I already told you this is inherent in all software development and all human activities. So what do we do? Well, again, I mentioned that the real problem here is the time it takes you to discover that you've made a bad design decision. You're going to make them, so as long as you can, you know, this is why waterfall fails, is because the time between making the bad decision and finding out is too long. Uh, in an iterative approach, you find out much more quickly. If you're sitting down with a customer, you might see it right away. Uh, certainly, getting feedback, if you're launching, if you're shipping stuff every day, you'll find out right away when something's wrong. And so, as a result, uh, you sort of avoid this problem space of the launch that looks like this. And you're more likely to end up with a product that looks more like this, one of my favorite versions. Uh, that said, though, even if you get things exactly right, and this is another place where, where waterfall fails, if you, even if you get things exactly right, the world is subject to change. And that's going to happen no matter what you do, no matter how good your uh, prescience about the future is, you're going to have the world change around you. And then this is really where Agile comes in. Because if you have a good uh, Agile code base, you can react to that change without having to rewrite it. So we'll go back to this notion again. I, I, that's one failure mode. This, this failure mode is also quite common. This is actually a much more common failure mode. Uh, not this, but this. This is a bridge that failed for a very different reason. It's actually engineered pretty much perfectly. But this is a classic bridge to nowhere. And I bring this up partly because we're in a political season, of course and we'll probably have lots more of these. This is a bridge to an island with 5,000 people on it. It is way over-specified. Has anybody here launched a startup and nobody cared? You know who you are. I know it's all of you, I've done it myself. So this is the much more common problem. It's great to have a good responsive code base, but honestly, if you over-engineer something and nobody ever hit, touches the website, you waste your time. So, Agile methods are really good for maintaining code flexibility, and that's critical. Uh, but at the same time, Agile really doesn't help you build the product right. It's one thing to build the product right, but it does not equate to building the right product. So, how does Agile tell you what to build? You know, what does Agile have to say about design? Well, in the words of this fine gentleman, 
Not a whole lot. That is a cricket. Um, if you really want to know what to build, you have to talk to somebody who's going to use your stuff. You need to talk to customers. And I pretty much guarantee that this guy knows more about his customers than you know about your customers. Does anyone here talk to a customer of whatever that is they're building? Good. Did you learn something? Did you change your mind about what you're building after you talked to your customer? It's okay not to. Did you have more confidence if you didn't change your mind? Did you have more confidence that you were building the right thing? So, once you talk to customers, of course, you find out new things. And then, of course, your code needs to be flexible enough and balanced and, uh, so that you can really respond to what you've learned. Uh, you know, to do lean well, Agile is pretty much assumed. It's not enough by itself, but you're going to have to be doing something with your code that's flexible. Uh, and so now I want to talk a little bit, switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, what makes a good Agile or lean practice. Uh, the big thing is they're, they're both very pragmatic. They're not, you know, we, we do these things because, you know, they're pragmatic, they're not dogmatic. Uh, we follow Agile practices and lean practices because they work. And when they don't work, we change them. It's really, really important. Uh, you know, I, a company that I used to work for, we tend to get very dogmatic about uh, the right way to do code. It's really, really important that we learn from what we're doing and improve our process on an ongoing basis. Um, being lean or being agile doesn't mean that we do whatever we want. It's actually a more, more rigorous, and not a less rigorous approach. Uh, we are being very, very evidence-based. Now, everything we do, TDD, you write the test first, does it work? I don't know, what does the test say? Lean, you know, did we do the right thing? I don't know, ask the customer, did it do what they needed? Um, and one thing that's really interesting about both agile and lean, you know, I've, I've made a career out of sort of leveraging these things in the world, but the fact is, they're not magic, they are uh, solutions to emergent product development problems. I talked about one emergent product development problem that we're going to make mistakes. Uh, they work because they solve these endemic, endemic problems, and we follow them because they provide demonstrable, repeatable results. Uh, and another thing that's interesting about them is because they're emergent solutions, similar solutions show up out in the wild, all by themselves. Uh, and so I'm going to give a little case study. Uh, this is actually Ravel's case study. He's our CTO at New Context. Um, but he used to have another job. And it was at a company called Odeo. Does anybody remember Odeo? I thought some people in this room might. If you're wondering what Odeo was, I'll give you a hint. Notice who the Flickr photo is by. Anyone heard of him in this building? So Odeo was a podcasting service. Uh, it was actually really good. I liked it. I used it. Um, and that was great and all until this other company came out with a, effectively a competing product it did other things, but one of the things it did was podcasts, and that product looked like this. Anyone use this? Well, if that was your business, that kind of sucks. So they, here they were with this business and all this money and a product that wasn't going to be viable in the market, and so they had to change something. So they developed a brand new product. You know what it was called? Hellodio! He thought I was going to say something else. Here's the launch for that. Uh, you know, here's this, it was a, a video embedding uh, app that lets you embed it, like, response, live response video into, into a web page. It was really cool. Didn't work. And they had this other thing. Does so anyone recognize this brand? Here's the launch. Odeo launches Twitter and Holodeo. I will leave it to you which one worked out better. They made enough money to buy two vowels. <laughs> Um, when they did this, and how they do this? This is an interesting story about how they did this, and, and obviously Owen does a much better job than I, Rabble does a much better job telling this than I, than I do, because he was there. But what they would do, once they decided that they needed to change what they were doing, uh, was every Wednesday, they'd get everybody together, and they would build a whole new MVP. They'd have a new idea, they would build an MVP, and what would they do with the MVP? They'd put it in front of customers, and they would test it. And they tested all sorts of ideas. That's how Holodio was built, that's how uh, the original Twitter was built. I don't know if you remember, but the original Twitter was an SMS-based thing. It didn't even have a web interface. And they learned that people really got a lot of engagement from that. And they, they saw people spending sometimes thousands of dollars on their SMSs 
because it was so engaging. And they found that they had some real signal. You know, we talk about lean startup, people talk about vanity metrics. The, all the vanity metrics said, this is not a business. But the real core metrics said, there's real engagement there, this is something that there is to build a product around. Of course, when they did it, it wasn't called lean. It was just a pragmatic approach to how do we solve this problem that our business just fell apart. So, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Really, it just matters that you do it. We tend in the industry to get really hung up on labels. I spent a whole year of my life down at Google just arguing about what, what we were going to call the unit tests. And that's not very interesting. We ended up with small, medium, and large tests. It's pretty awesome. Good use of my life. Um, what you do, it's important, there's some, there's some real value in sort of understanding the theory because the theory helps you to understand how to apply the theory better. But the theory doesn't matter at all unless you actually apply it. So thinking about how you're going to do validation is great because maybe it helps you to understand how to do it better. But that's the only thing it's for. So when we talk about Agile, as I mentioned, it's really optimized for flexibility. Um, you know, it's in the nature of things that we learn more about whatever we're working on the longer we do it. The longer we're working in a specific problem space, the more we're going to know about the right way to do something. So that tells us that if you're going to maximize your return on learning, you need code that's flexible. So again, this is why, you know, there's a bunch of techniques in Agile that help you have flexible code, things like TDD slash BDD, uh, continuous integration. These are all things that give you a code base that you're, you can make deep changes to and you're not going to be afraid to broke anything. So that's really important about Agile. Um, are you afraid to broke something? It's supposed to do that. It's supposed to help you not be worried about that. So Agile is optimized for flexibility. Lean is really optimized for learning. Um, Lean Startup is really optimized to manage and reduce the cost of learning. And one of the things to think about, one of the things I talk a lot about is how do you learn something as cheaply as possible? Uh, just great languages like Ruby and Rails. Um, that our friend Mott's here. Ruby gave us. Uh, and that's great because it reduces the cost of coding. It makes you able to produce things faster. But if you can test out a thesis without writing a line of code, please do that. Because I guarantee, even if you can do something really fast, like in a day or an hour, you can do it a lot faster on a whiteboard in two seconds. So it's sort of incumbent on us as product people and developers to think about, how do I learn something as cheaply as possible? Because the thing is, the more quickly we can learn what to build, the more cheaply we can build the right thing. And also the better that thing will be. Now, if we can go through more iterations, the likelihood that we're going to have a product that people actually want to use uh, sooner goes up. And the likelihood we'll have a viable business also goes up because we won't be spending money on the wrong thing. Uh, Agile is really adaptive to change. Lean basically admits that you don't know what to build, which is great, and then it also gives you some tools to help you find out. So with that, this is a little bit to what your appetite. If you want to learn more about Lean Startup, come to the Lean Startup Conference that we're hosting here in San Francisco December 3rd. Um, we've been organizing the event uh, with Eric. Um, I want to thank the Fukuoka RB folks for having me. Uh, and I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, months or three years to build, it's still going to take you six months or three years to build. You're just going to know you're on the right track a week in instead of three years in. So there's a lot that can be done 
I, I think, you know, you mentioned SpaceX and some of the stuff that's happening there. They do engine tests, right? Like, they don't just build all spaceship, try it. Didn't work. Oh, shit. <laughs> what do we do now? What, I don't know what to do with all these parts. There's a bunch of, I can recycle, right? <laughs> um, so I think that these, there's nothing about linear agile that tells you not to, to take on big projects. I think that you, it's still a question of what's your cost of learning? How do I shorten my cost of learning? There's a lot about just pure lean theory in terms of how do I shorten my cycle time? How do I get feedback as cheaply as possible? And sometimes as cheaply as possible is not very cheap. Like if you want to know how to get into near Earth orbit, that's going to be some work and it's going to cost some money and it's going to take more than a, than a weekend. I mean, you can buy all the Estes rockets you want, but that's not going to get you into near Earth orbit. So I think it, it's more a way of changing the way you think about how you approach a problem than a specific set of like something that's scaled to a specific size of organization. And I think that same scientific method, the same rigor that you can bring to how you think about a problem applies very much, I mean, honestly, it's more valuable the larger the scale of the thing is. If you can cut down from 20 years to three years, it still is a three-year project, but if you can actually have the right thing at the end, that's really helpful. I think one of the stats that you get a lot of the time is like, 70% of IT projects fail, right? I think, has everybody heard that? Pardon? Well, you think it's higher, and I think it's probably higher too, but part of the problem is the 30% that succeed the metric of success was, did it blow up completely? You know, like, so 30% don't blow up completely. That's awesome. What an industry. What, aren't we, shouldn't we all be proud? Let's all pat ourselves on the back right now. Nobody counts how many of these products nobody cares about. So, you know, whether it's a big project like going into space or building the next self-driving car, there's lots of little experiments along the way that can validate that we're on the right track. Sure. It's very similar, I mean, I think we, tr like, so the question was, how does the new context development methodology compare to the pivotal development methodology? I was there for seven years, I, like, I, I lived and, and breathed that. Um, I think where we've changed, uh, we're still very rigorous about test driven, we're still trying to push the envelope on better testing. I think there's a little bit of a tuning around the amount of testing at a given phase. So one of the things that I care a lot about at new context is, let's get something shipped the first week. Let's get something in front of customers, like week one, week two, week three, let's, let's be, and, and in those early stages, um, there's a whole long talk I could give about code debt and when you should take it on. We have this, like, we have this knee-jerk reaction, like, code debt is always bad. Debt is only bad if you don't know that you're taking it on and aren't responsible with it. So there are times to take on code debt. If you think there's a, you know, one in 50 chance that you're on the right track, maybe don't spend quite as much time on what it's going to take to refactor the thing later. That said, as soon as you know you're onto something, pay down the code debt fast because the code debt is going to accrue interest over the life of the code base. So I'd say that's, I'd say that's probably the biggest sort of nuance in the way we approach things differently in the new context model versus the pivotal model. But you know, at the core, we're still very, very serious about test driven uh, and behavior driven and, and all this kind of validation. And then also we're bringing in this layer of consumer validation, customer validation, and all the lean stuff. Does that answer the question? Any next question, sir? Okay. How do I? Thankfully, I don't have an Ancelli, so I don't have this problem. The question was, what other analogies do I use to describe lean? Um, I talk a lot about just different kinds of feedback systems. Um, great, like I use the example of. It, what would it take you to, how much energy and planning would it take to engineer driving to the corner store to get milk? Like if you had to decide at the beginning every turn in the road in order to get someplace, uh, this is more, I mean in some ways it's more of an, an agile analogy, but the amount of, this is sort of what happens when we, when, you know, when NASA plans to go to Mars, they have to figure out exactly what the trajectory of the spaceship is at every time and how it self-corrects and, and how it tunes. The idea of being much more, it's very easy for me to go to the store. Or like I just go, I don't even have to really, I have this vague notion of the store that I'm going to. I might have an idea along the way that I actually want to go to the other store, or I might find out when I get to the store that they don't have the thing that I want. Um, so that's one kind of analogy. And I think with feedback, it's more of a question of, like, this the same thing applies to, to user feedback. Would it? Yes? Does that answer your question? 
I went, I'm, doing, I'm doing a raffle. What am I giving away? A what? A year's income. A year's income. Um, so, last question? Yes, I, I was supposed to ask one more question first. If I speak only in 30 seconds, so... Oh, sure, if you could ask. Not to be foggy. Not to be the focus, but 12 years ago, I drank the XP Kool-Aid from Ken Beck. I understand the many advantages thereof. The thing about it is there are certain assumptions about XP Lean and so forth. One is that customers know what they want. That can be a black hole. The other thing is that a very effective Lean Agile team tends to be a group of very proficient, very professional, smart, kick-ass developers. And so there are certain kind of pitfalls that are involved. The thing is that you cannot assume that the final product is equal to the sum of the incremental steps toward that product because people don't necessarily know either the developers nor the customers what they want. So that's all I'm trying to say. It's more of a comment than a question. I love XP and the whole methodology, but it's not a silver bullet. That's my comment. There are two. I have a response to each of those. I would actually look slides that answer the second, the, the first question. There's a whole talk, I won't give the whole talk. But, and I will do the raffle, I promise. Uh, if I have it right here, I'm gonna go through this really quick. Oh, here we go, this is actually it, okay. Hang on one second, I'm gonna put these up. Uh, you talk about customers not doing what they want. Not necessarily. Not honestly. Uh, customers don't necessarily know what they want, great. I'm gonna do contradictory advice on that. But the contradictory advice is correct. The advice, one, listen to customers. Two, don't listen to customers. <laughs> and I give you this classic quote that gets literally trotted out all the time. If I had asked customers for what they want, they'd have said faster horses. So don't listen to them. Oh, wait a minute. Do listen to them. Listen to customers. Don't listen to what they say. Listen to what they say it tells you about what they want to do. If you had asked, if I'd ask my customers what do they want, they'd say faster horses. Why do they want faster horses? What would faster horses let them do? So you do listen. You just don't do what they say. <laughs> Build your own hypothesis. That's non-trivial. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying this is easy. This is why we get the big money. But it gets a lot easier when you test your hypothesis. So don't ask them what they want. Look at their behavior, because behavior doesn't lie. Uh, check to see that what you gave them actually does what they want. There's a, there's a little cycle. List, you know, listen, interpret, synthesize, hypothesize, check. Super important, especially the last part. But if you do this, it makes it a lot easier. This is not for the average developer. It's for the average developer. Skill matters, but you can train skill. And the fact is, pairing, you know, this came up in the last talk. You can train your, you can train good designers, and you can train good developers, and that's really the best way to go. You can. We do it all the time. Come by, we'll show you. All right. So now I have a raffle to do. Jay stuff. 
Uh, does anybody know? Uh, tell me something interesting about Jay's diet. Anyone? Plant strong. Plant strong, correct. You win a ticket to it. Here's your cuff. <laughs> Jay is in fact vegan. I thought it was going to be trivia. I better be trivia. Anything else I should say? <laughs> oh, what time? So what time is it I know what time it is in Tokyo. I know. Most <laughs> Oh, you have? Yes. Do I need another question? Okay.